Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by my co-host, Ian Cinnamon, and a very special guest, Antonio Garcia Martinez. One of the things that you are really excited about, you wrote this great, great piece on your blog, The Pull Request, is on why the Web3 ecosystem needs attribution or should be thinking about ads in a smarter way. Uh, you're the guy who has a, the background here. You uh, helped build the first ad exchange in Facebook that you, uh, you know, wrote about beautifully in uh, in Chaos Monkeys. Um, you also worked at Branch Metrics, and you also worked uh, you briefly, uh, famously, infamously um, at uh, at Apple. And so, before I want to get into what you want to do in Web three, I want to get into what you did in Web two, uh, or how, how that evolved a, a bit. To, so, help us set the stage a little bit. Uh, about your 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 experience there and uh, and how the ad ecosystem evolved. Oh wow, the big picture of how the total ads ecosystem <laughs> has evolved. Man, okay, I, this is this is going to be calling a lot, even for my like PM hand waving, you know, Jedi mind tricks here. Maybe it's best to start with a question I used to get. Uh, so my first job out of grad school, <clears throat> after I uh, dropped out of a PhD in physics, like many failed physicists, I went into finance. Finance is the last refuge of physics scoundrels. And so I I was uh, I was modeling credit risk at, at Goldman. It blew up, and then I went to my first ad tech startup, which is a company that raised a bunch of money, but never shipped a product, which is an interesting introduction. But it was very much in the vein of quantitative advertising, kind of what you're asking about in the sort of high period of it in like the late, in the late aughts. People ask me like, well, what, you know, how do you go from modeling credit derivatives to modeling ads? And the reality is that it's very similar, right? Like in the same way that, um, you know, high frequency trading and a lot of the Wall Street world and the derivatives world became very quantitative, what used to be kind of an old boys network and very qualitative, the advertising world has undergone that process over the course of the past 20 years or so. And so the fact that there is some Wall Street quant who then goes to the ad tech world and becomes an ad tech quant isn't actually as surprising as it might sound. Um, and in fact, just historically, a lot of ad tech companies have been based in New York because they share the same talent pool as Wall Street, frankly. Um, and in fact, there's even a notion of like, media trading desks inside New York media agencies. And it's exactly what it sounds, right? Lots of people with lots of screens buying media. And so the media world has gone from a world, you know, Chris Dixon has this great term skeuomorphic. And what he means by that is a new version of media imitates the previous version of media, right? And he usually means it in a negative connotation. I see it more as just an inevitable way that human media evolves. One example of skeuomorphism is if you look at the first display ads, like the ads that you see on the regular web, they look exactly like a newspaper, like the first newspaper ads that came out in the 1830s, right? It's this sort of blob of visual kind of noise or distraction alongside more or less straight line text. And in the early days, that was, I actually dug up what's called an insertion order, which is how you used to trade media, uh, you know, with literally a fax number on it. And it's exact, and it, 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 the term insertion order actually comes from the newspaper world because you would insert something into the regular copy of the newspaper. And so early on, the internet media was exactly analogous other than it being on pixels than the newspaper world, but things changed very quickly. And how did they change? A, a few things changed. One thing is, you know, rather than it being what's called so-called contextual targeting, I, I'm showing an ad for a car in the Yahoo Autos or the New York Times auto review section. It becomes personalized. Like, actually, I can actually track this user. And and rather than paying thirty dollars for for every thousand ads on Yahoo Autos, I can pay thirty cents on some blog that that user is on. Ten seconds later, right? Um, and so the unbundling of the audience from the publisher and the media has been one of the big stories of the past 10, 20 years of media. It's exactly why traditional newspapers have kind of lost, right? And got upstreamed to use a layered David term by companies like Facebook and Google, because you can find the, you can find the audience all sorts of places, right? And it's not really about the content or the distribution. It's about uh, the actual people that show up, right? And so a lot of the story around ads is basically just how do you track and target people correctly? And, that, and this has been the promise. You go back and read the decks from 2008. That was the promise of the original companies like DoubleClick and Right Media. Their vision is what, we've, what we see now, which is that literally every time you go to a website or, or an app and have an experience, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, that actually gets tracked inside what's called an attribution or an analytics package, right? And sometimes that's internal to Facebook. Sometimes it's an independent third party, like Branch Metrics, the company you mentioned that I work for, that's one of the big ones. And it basically keeps track of all the user touch points. And the reason for doing that is because it answers the big question that everyone has about media, which is, well, you know, I paid for this media upstream, like ads, social media, organic, and then I get paid down when you're actually in the experience. How do I how do I compare how much it costs to get this user versus, versus how much I made off of them? Right? And I know this sounds a little wonky, and, and maybe some of your readers, are, you know, yeah, eyes are rolling over, ears are sort of getting bored here. But um, if you want to know, you know, I always say attribution is kind of like 
running water and flush toilets in a city, right? Like nobody thinks about it except the plumbers. But if your toilet broke and everybody else is in the city's toilet broke, you would think about nothing else and civilization would be like teetering at the brink of collapse, right? Because um, you'd have, you know, cholera outbreaks and God knows what. Um, so attribution is in the same way. And in fact, and this isn't hyperbolic, right? Like we've seen an example of it. Recently, there's this thing called ATT that you might've heard about, which is ads tracking and transparency. Apple's basically saying, look, you can't pull the individual user identifier out of the phone like you used to. And so that means when Facebook runs an ad and some gaming company sells you on, uh, upsells you on a game, they can't talk about the same person and, and, and say, oh, and figure out exactly how that person got there and why and how much it costs to get there. Apple basically said, no, we're going to make that very coarse grained. We're going to control the attribution and the ads going forward, right? Obviously, it's no secret now. They hired me. They have an ad system that they're building. And attribution lets you do that. And if you can't do that, then you're like Facebook and they this quarter they announced they're going to lose $10 billion in revenue this year. Or so I was just looking at Snap's shares are down almost 50% this week. <laughs> and uh, due to a letter that Evan Spiegel sent out in which... I hate poking fun at you know entrepreneurs and founders because you know life is rough. But he you know he blamed the travails of Snap on <clears throat> the supply chain crisis and the war on the Ukraine. And you know I wasn't aware that the memes of production were located outside of Kiev or that uh, you know memes came on ships from China. Um, I think a more likely story is that in fact Apple's ATT is biting Snap in the ass like it's biting Facebook in the ass, and all the various tricks and acrobatics that companies like Snap and Facebook have to do in a world where they can't do attribution, like fingerprinting your device. A lot of it gets a little shady. Um, isn't very effective and frankly is goes against Apple's terms of service. And so they're getting bitten by it. So if, if attribution breaks down, everything breaks down. And again, attribution we've had in every form of human media going back to the newspapers. In the late 19th century, one of the key elements of newspaper ads was, I forget his name, somebody published circulation figures for all the New York newspapers. And then they could sell at they could sell ads against those circulation numbers. So whether it be radio and Arbitron statistics, TV and Nielsen, Facebook and its attribution system newspapers and circulation numbers, there's always attribution in human media. There's no way you can have a media ecosystem without it. And so anyhow, it sounds like I'm, um, I'm sounds like I'm pitching you and maybe I am, but the, the point is that in web three, you're not going to have a media ecosystem in web three, unless you actually have appropriate attribution of some form. A great overview. Before we dive into the web three element, sticking with web two, it sounds like there's a lot of different players involved, right? You have the publishers, you have the uh, uh, the advertisers who are actually purchasing the ads, and then you have uh, effectively these device manufacturers, Apple, Android, Google, et cetera, who set their own bar. How many different players are there in the attribution chain just in the Web2 realm? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you're right. It's it's like super complicated. This is this is an audio medium, but there's this thing called the Lumascape, and there's also something called the Martech landscape. Basically imagine like a slide literally packed almost to the point of like a couple pixels of logos. And that's the current ad tech ecosystem. And each of those logos is in various functional boxes. Attribution is just one of them. It's one of the most important ones, but you have like customer data warehousing of various sorts. You have buy side platforms that buy on exchanges. You have sell side platforms that sell on exchanges. You have the ad servers that actually serve the ads. There's a hundred different roles in this, but if you just pull out from that and just take the biggest players, they're what you're highlighting. Well, you've got the user, obviously. You've got the app publisher, which could be a Facebook. It could be a web blog, could be Substack, could be New York Times, whatever it is. You've got the handset manufacturer, which isn't necessarily the maker of the OS, right? In the Android ecosystem, you have companies that you've never heard of, like Xiaomi, or maybe ones that you have, like Samsung, that basically sell kind of a commodity phone with an open source operating system with a bunch of like weird bloatware on it that you don't actually want when you buy the phone. Um, in the case of Apple, of course, it's, it's completely vertical integrated hardware, software, ad system, the whole deal. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of players and lots of power centers there. And you know, if you ask like what's the impact of the carrier on this, you'd almost have to take specific companies and scenarios into account to even answer that question because it's so it's so nuanced. Zooming out, but before we zoom back in, wh why has the ad tech kind of like startup ecosystem been such a graveyard the last like decade pl plus? Is, is it because and you even showed me uh, the the Martech ecosystem the other day and how how crowded that that is and how hard that space is too? Um, is it because the gains have just gone to incumbents or? How do we think about that? I mean, ad tech used to be a super area of growth with lots of VC funding for it. And, and, and you know, I've worked in a bunch of ad tech startups, the one that I've started, later stage ones that I've worked for. And it's true that it's not so much the case anymore. When I went to Apple, <clears throat> the only reason why I stayed in ad tech is ad tech is a little bit dead. As much as I love ads and I think ads are good for you and like vitamins, you should have a certain number every day. You should have your RDA of ads. You know, it gets a little old after a while. And the only reason I went to Apple is because the, the last chapter of this ad tech saga that I've sketched out very roughly is... A little bit of flipping of the architecture. So, I mean, this is a little bit of a rabbit hole, but what, what Apple and Google and other companies are doing, and we built a, we built a prototype of this, a branch, that's why I ended up getting the job at Apple, is a lot of the data that now lives in the cloud. Like, you know, you think about your mental model for how the internet works, like you do shit on your phone or on your laptop, stuff goes into the cloud, 
stuff happens that you don't have total control over. And then you get an experience, right? An ad or another page loads or whatever, right? That's a very old way of architecting things. That's almost like a you know thin client fat server to use kind of dated language, you know, ar- architecture for it. These phones that we have in our pockets and I'm like gesticulating with my phone in my hand are actually fairly powerful computers. There's, it's not clear why you shouldn't be running a lot of that logic or have a lot of that data on your phone. Like, why do you have to hit the cloud for a lot of that stuff? There's a lot of reasons why it should live on the phone, right? Um, you know, one of the great revolutions we've seen in the past 10 years say is that most, most human interaction with the internet is now on mobile via native apps running on the phone, which I know sounds very natural to us, but when I was at Facebook, they were still dicking around with HTML5. They, they didn't focus on the app. The Android app was like slow. Like we, we haven't been living in a mobile app world kind of that long in, in the schemes of the overarching thing of, of the internet. So there's, um, you know, the, the last chapter of that is actually putting a lot of the stuff on device, which is what Apple's doing, both as a privacy thing and obviously a strategic block against, you know, the Facebooks of the world. But that was it. Like, to me, that's like the last chapter of this ad tech saga. Like, there's not much, I mean, there's micro pockets of it. For example, podcast ads are kind of interesting, right? And are still in their relative infancy. So you you could imagine building a parallel ad stack, which is happening, by the way, in the podcasting world. Audio ads are a little bit different for a bunch of reasons. But there's not like a lot of stuff left to do, right? Like, you know, if VR, AR actually takes off as the next way that humans intermediate their entire lives via screens, then maybe you would have another saga begin there, but that hasn't quite happened yet. And so I, I just think we're at the end of the line when it comes to ads, at least in Web 2. Of course, Web 3, I think, changes all of that. But in the Web 2 world, there's just not a lot of, that needs to be built, right? Like on that MarTech chart that I showed you, which you should probably include a link to in the notes or whatever, like there isn't a lot of space left for another logo. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, the... Um... You mentioned, you know, half in jest, but I also think somewhat serious that ads are good for you. I I think as a response to the flack that ads have gotten from a variety of different people who said, you know, they they blame ads for why, you know, journalism looks like Buzz, looked like BuzzFeed for a bit and, you know, appealing to lowest common denominator or, you know, for clicks, et cetera, or, you know, even people in the Web3 world call it like the original sin of the internet and it led to all this divisiveness or something. What say you, is that all hogwash or why are they Um, all yeah, I think it's almost exactly wrong. Like 180 degree incorrect, right? Um, but it, it, but it's a subtle point. Like, it, I mean, sure. Look, I mean, you know, I'm not a huge well, fan. St- steal me on the critique. What, what's the be- best version of the critique, and then let's address it. I mean, sure. There's yes for some for some types of media and for some types of ads, the notion of clickbait, trying to drive clicks above all else, is actually the goal. But in the reality, in, ad, in the ad tech world, it's moved from clicks to downstream actions like installs or upgrades. And so it's like real things that monetize. It's not just a superficial action. So it's not true that broadly the entire ecosystem is focused on clicks. Again, if you look at the way that most media is priced, it's not it's not click-based. Like you don't actually make money on the click, right? So it's just not a correct statement about where the state of the media, the media world is. And more broadly to put on my like Marshall McLuhan media theorist hat, right? It's weird, right? It, it's all the people who are actually criticizing ads. Ads created this sort of 60 to 70 year bubble of American journalism of like both sides, objective fact check journalism that doesn't attempt to placate at least overtly a certain point of view that was a luxury born of ads right i mean you realize the reason why and this is a unique i think most americans don't realize most parts of the world even europe doesn't have this journalistic tradition of objectivity and both sides has been fact checking all the rest of it it's kind of unique to the united states part of it was theoretical a guy named walter Lippmann was one of the earliest theorists he wrote a book called public opinion and a bunch of other books that was very formative in early American journalism history. A lot of it was just ideological because a lot of the American press around World War I was biased, but a lot of it was purely commercial, right? Macy's needed a relatively non-polarizing <clears throat> wide audience newspaper to run its ads in, right? It didn't, it didn't want, if you look at most of 19th century American media, you know, the press Democrat was the Democratic newspaper in that town, right? And if you were a member of the Democratic Party, you subscribed to that paper. It was often run by the parties themselves, or either directly or indirectly, or you bought the Republican paper, whatever it was, right? But things were mostly subscription-based and things were things are more polarized in a world in which the user pays for the content they want because the user ultimately will get what they want, which is having their own views of the world repeated back at them, right? That's what users actually want. They don't actually want truth or fact check journalism, right? And so a lot of the journalists that we're pining for, if the, oh, you know, the New York Times investigative team that can spend a year investigating corruption and comes to this conclusion and does a social good. That was all that was created in the world of, of, of ads, right? That didn't exist in 19th century world subscriptions, right? And so I, I think blaming ads is actually wrong. And I think what you're increasingly seeing, and people are seeing more and more polarization in media and are trusting media less and less. It's not because we have too many ads. On the contrary, it's because the entire ecosystem is shifting to subscriptions, right? I think for the first time ever in the past couple of years, New York Times actually makes more money off its subscriptions than off ads, right? Its digital product is doing very well, right? 
Would you say that the New York Times objectivity, political objectivity has increased over the past few years? I wouldn't. I, I still think there's good journalism that happens there. Like I'm not totally digging it, but I wouldn't say that, you know, I wouldn't say that it's become a, a more balanced product as a result of the fact that subscribers pay for it. Look at Substack, which I also like and I'm part of and I get paid through it and all the rest of it. If you look at people who write there, some of them are very gifted. I wouldn't say that it's often very balanced reporting, right? It's it's journalism more like you see, again, historically in the United States or even in Europe now, in which that it's told from a very clear political point of view. And if, if you actually want like fact-checked objective journalism, you have to read between the lines a little bit and actually maybe read a couple of Substacks to actually get the real story. <laughs> It's interesting that despite the enabling that ads has created, when we now transition to Web3 and think about this future world, one of the major promises is get rid of ads. We don't need ads. We're not going to fund it via ads. We're going to fund it via tokens. We're going to fund it via different incentives. What's your take on that? Is that accurate? Are people missing the point? Yeah. I mean, uh, again, I I can see why people have an anti-ad sort of animus because, again, ads kind of suck and companies like Google and Facebook have a massive take rate, don't pay creators. Like there's all sorts of negative sort of juju around ads. And I, I totally get it, right? But again, <clears throat> if you do an NFT or a token drop in Web3, hate to break it to you, that's an ad, okay? That's a piece of paid media that you're using to shape user behavior for some expected, you know, down funnel action. That is an ad. There are already ads in Web3. There's already there's already ads fraud in Web3. I forget what project it is that's doing a token drop. They announced it. And so everyone signed up fake wallets to get the drop and not actually use the product. There's already ads fraud, right? And they had to go and kill, I think it was like 13,000 wallets that were obviously fake. Right? You already have ads, you already have ads fraud. Of course, ads, when I say ads coming to Web3, I don't mean bringing the Google and Facebook bullshit and, you know, little 300 by 250 pixel squares popping up all over everything. That's not what I mean, right? Like ads in a Web3 world, right, can get, can actually fulfill the mission of Web3, which is ownership and getting creators paid and actually creating, you know, a creative, you know, thriving cultural landscape, right? In a Web3 world, right, you can picture replacing a Google or a Facebook with a blockchain, for example, right? And let's say, you know, the world of NFTs is going to expand beyond million dollar, well, not even million dollar anymore, but whatever, expensive apes, right? It's going to be all sorts of other things, right? And, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I'm out, out here in the high desert. I did a drone video with my Jeep because I was farting around with a drone on my Jeep. Came out really good. It looks like a fucking Jeep commercial. In some future web free version of TikTok or whatever, I'll share that video. Jeep will look at it and say, oh, look, here's the Jeep user we want to promote. You know, show us your Jeep or whatever in which users post cool content about their thing. They use it for brand marketing. I get paid. A user, you know, other users enjoy it by seeing my cool drone video. The world is happy. And guess what? There's no Google or Facebook in the picture, right? That That is also an ad driven world. And I wouldn't get paid for that unless that existed, right? Because no one's going to like sit there and pay for a Jeep video. Right? Like they're not, you're not going to charge admission on what is kind of like a lightweight media experience. You're just not, right? And so, <clears throat> again, I, I think, yes, there, there will have to be ads of some form in Web3. There's no way there's not going to be that. Um, and again, but I just don't think it's not going to be at all like the Web2 ads that we're, that we're used to, fortunately. So it makes sense if we were to draw a line and say Web2 goes away, we're all fully in Web3. But in this Web2.5 transition, right, you have the Googles and the Facebooks and these other ad Web2 ad-centric companies who see Web3 and want to, deal, want to dabble in it and want to figure out ads in it. Do you think they're going to embrace that more Web3 savvy advertising? Or what, how do we transition the Web2 into the Web3 uh, in terms of ads? Yeah, I mean, this is a good point, right? Because again, like most revolutionaries, they think they're going to remake the world. Like the French revolutionaries who've changed even the calendar and canceled the Catholic Church, right? The Web3 people think they're just going to rewrite the rules of human society and complete break with the past, which is a great, brave vision. I think realistically, like you said, there's, we're going to live in a Web 2.5 world, to, to coin the term here. Maybe we just coined a meme in which you're going to have the Web 2 and Web 3 coexisting for a while. I, you know, I tend to think that Web 2 is not going to transition to Web 3 particularly well. If you look at a lot of the Web 3 style projects that Web 2 companies have sort of um, indulged, like, um, you know, Twitter's one, Blue, whatever it's called, like that never really took off beyond like PFPs. I, I think it's going to be hard for them tra- to transition there. Again, they're not going to lose what they have, I think. I mean, if you look at it, the history of tech more broadly, right, it's it's almost never the case that incumbents lose their fiefdoms, right? Like Microsoft never lost a desktop. Google has never really lost search. Facebook, at least a trifecta of like Instagram, Facebook, and, and, and WhatsApp hasn't really lost that, at least for a certain generation, right? You just create new experiences and new worlds to conquer that other companies then dominate. And the old company maybe stays relevant if their fiefdom stays relevant, but if it doesn't, they just stay there, right? So I, I, I don't see Web2 coming into Web3 directly, but I see Web3 having to deal with Web2. Like I've talked to Web3 gaming companies that buy Web2 style like user acquisition ads, like on Facebook, like they just buy a fucking ad and they direct you to their website where you're like, you're invited to log in with a wallet. Right. There you have it. Like Web 2 is like colliding with Web 3. 
And if you're that company, like one of their pain points is like, well, how do I manage identity across these different worlds, right? Because identity sounds like this very philosophical concept, but again, super getting back to this attribution thing, identity is like the primary key in the global database of all this shit. If you, if you lose that, or if you don't have a common foreign key between web two and web three to use database lingo here a little bit, then you're stuck. <laughs> you just can't join it all, right? And so there's gonna have to be some, some level of companies that actually do some amount of decentralized identity that spans both wallets and the sort of device IDs and cookies that we're used to in the web two world. So just to double tap on that governor and web two transitioning to web three, I do think there's something interesting we've observed, which is you take certain brands like Nike, Gucci and others, and they seem to have actually started to make the jump into the Web3 world much more effectively than these traditional Web2 tech companies. Do you think that's just something inherent in their DNA that fits better with Web3? Or why are these tech Web2 companies that you highlighted, maybe they're going to struggle more? Why is that? Well, because the companies you're naming are, are you know, brand marketing, are basically brand marketing experiments, right? Like, you know, Nike is is a brand marketer with like a little shoe habit on the side, right? To look at it from the the hard nosed view of the marketer, right? It, you know, in, in the same way that a game developer is really a a growth marketing engine with like a little coding habit on the side, right? And so, you know, what if the, what has taken what have been some of the actual consumer experiences of Web three that have taken off, right? NFTs and some amount of Web three gaming like Axie and a few other metaverse type games, right? The, the, the NFT world, it's cool, it's slick, it's hot, it's interesting. Um, it's attached to actual ownership and creativity, right? People like the Board Ape Yacht Club has a brand and a collection to it, right? I mean, it's the artists are kind of anonymous, although they got docs, whatever, but it's they have a presence, right? And brands love that, right? And, you know, <clears throat> again, in this future world, brands navigate to influencers, right? Because to them, it's their it's their form of like performance marketing, right? And and I, I do think the NFT world, or the Web3 world is going to be one driven a lot by, I, I hate the term influencer because it sounds so kind of wanky, but it's more just... Someone who owns their own personal creative messaging, which might be of service to a brand marker of some sort, right? And again, in the Web3 world, that influencer can actually own it, right? They're not just like getting money on the side for like Instagramming a thing, right? Which is how it works now. Yeah. Zooming back out again, if 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 you're 2009, I'm not sure exactly when you were at Facebook, but if, if you're a Facebook self, we're, we're here in the Zoom chat and we're catching up on how everything, how the whole ecosystem evolved, what would have been most surprising to you know the the version of you that was at Facebook. Yeah, well, I mean, I was there until 2013, so it wasn't that. Sadly, it was not since 2009 because things would have been not a lot better. Um, <clears throat> 2013, but um, I mean, a lot of what of what evolved with Facebook did catch me by surprise, right? Like the ad system did a lot better. I was a little pessimistic when I left. You know, there was just a couple years in there right before. I mean, I cover this in my in my memoir, Chaos Monkeys, right before the IPO when. The ad system kind of sucked at Facebook. Back. When I got there and I looked at the average CPM, the average cost per ad, when I logged in, I couldn't believe how low it was. Like, what the fuck? How is this possible? Um, it was like worse in that sense. <clears throat> but that, that quickly changed, right? I mean, if one thing that Facebook's really good at as a company is that it spots problems and then just like mobilizes in almost military fashion to solve it, which they did in the case of ads. And so not just stuff I did, but me and a bunch of people built a bunch of shit in those two years that became the core of Facebook's monetization engine. So like newsfeed ads, like there didn't used to be ads in newsfeed, video ads, for example, custom audiences targeting, that's sort of in the spirit of the exchange that you mentioned, app install targeting, they shift an attribution system, right? There didn't used to be an attribution system to Facebook. When you clicked away from Facebook, Facebook had no idea what was going on inside of Facebook, like none, none whatsoever, right? And so they built a lot of these key things that are now what drives most of growth at, or what drives most of revenue at, at Facebook. So I think the fact that they actually managed to build, again, it, it, it's, it, it's, I'm going to sound like an old fart, but like at some point, like for a while, it was hard to convince people to spend money on Facebook ads, right? Like it wasn't a, a given. Like Facebook was weird, right? Compared to the conventional display world or search, Facebook was just strange. The ad format was strange. The targeting wasn't there. There was no attribution. People didn't use it. It was hard to convince them to use it. I mean, part of the reason why I pitched Zuck on the opening scene in the book is me pitching the executive team that we need to do like real targeting. And he didn't really know what he was saying yes to. I, I had barely understood it myself, but it was clear that we needed to have some way to actually you know, merge the Facebook ads experience with the outside ads experience. We had lived as a walled garden for a very long time. Right? And of course, where it landed, it didn't become like another open ecosystem like Google, right? Which is what, what I thought it would do. It actually became kind of a kind of a weird hybrid in which you don't give your data to Facebook. Facebook doesn't give the data to you. You just join and agree that, hey, this guy, Eric Torenberg, and this guy, Ian, put them into one bucket and show them this ad, right? And that's how Facebook talks to the world. But yeah, that the fact that they actually built that engine and built it so well, I'm mean, not shocked by it, but I, yeah, it's kind of surprising. Yeah. The, the reason I ask, I ask that question is to kind of make a parallel here 
you know, we're at the beginning or, you know, the ad ecosystem web three doesn't even exist yet you know, because web three bar barely exists. Uh, but, you know, let's say we're doing this podcast a decade from now and we're reflecting um, how, how the ecosystem evolved. What are the different, like either forks in the road or what are the different ways it, it could go? Or like, what, what, how do you sort of see it, uh, you know, emerging or evolving? I think it's hard to speculate. I mean, I could sit here and just riff on random shit, right? But that's why I think building the attribution system first is actually important because I mean, there's a lot of things that are different about that are re the reverse of Web two and Web three, right? So, like in Web two, you would build a compelling user experience, a consumer experience, and then figure out how to monetize it later. Like I just discussed, Facebook ad system even the year before the IPO kind of sucked, right? They, they weren't taking the monetization side seriously. In Web three, conversely, you figure out the economics and the token ecosystem first, right? And how that actually and how you incentivized good decentralized behavior, and then you build compelling user experiences after the fact, right? Which is interesting, right? It, it's also kind of negative in the sense that it opens it up to fraudsters and Ponzi's and whatnot, but it's, it's just kind of a reverse way of doing things. I think similarly in the sort of monetization side of it, attribution is going to come first in Web3 because counting what happens inside, what tokens are bought, what NFTs are bought, whatever, like keeping track of all that shit is just important. I mean, it's what you do with the blockchain. The blockchain is a, is a shared form of decentralized state, right? And, and so is an attribution system, right? Part of this idea of like attribution web three came from like, okay, in the web two world, what would you actually build from the ground up as a blockchain? Attribution is the answer, right? Like the company I worked at branch effectively should be some sort of decentralized ledger, right? And then looking at web three, what's missing also attribution, right? <clears throat> and so I think attribution comes first on the web three side. What are the ads going to look like? Well, again, NFTs are obviously already being used as ads. Again, you can imagine a world in which if if the world of creative NFTs expands beyond you know just apes and a bunch of other stuff, you can imagine that being used in brand marketing in some form or another. I think it's going to be a lot about incentivizing. It's going to be like a bound, like driving driving user behaviors in various forms and paying people for it is how it's going to work going forward. You're going to have some sort of, if you want to call it CPA because you want to sound like an ad tech OG, you can call it a bounty system if you want. But basically, if a user goes and does something inside your game and does some like blockchain verifiable on-chain action, you get paid for having driven that thing, right? Um, and so marketing goes from this thing where the marketing team rolls in every quarter into the ad network or into the publisher. And then they figure out how much the customer acquisition cost was that quarter and how much they're going to spend on you versus Google versus anybody else. It goes from a world in which, no, actually you're just staking a certain number of tokens into an advertising ecosystem and saying, look, <clears throat> in a very smart contract way, I'm willing, I'm willing to spend $30,000 for user acquisition this quarter. And I want to pay $30 per user, make it happen, right? And various people, affiliates, ad networks, whoever, make it happen. They get paid again, in a very tokeny Web3 sort of way. And that's the new form of marketing, right? That's that's how ads work inside Web3. It's not, it is not the old Web2 world. You, you don't, the middlemen like Google and Facebook don't make, don't have vast take rate that may not exist at all in this ecosystem. It's really going to be an interaction mediated by the blockchain between the creatives who create the creative that's interesting, the you know, app developers who want to drive user behavior and the users themselves. So there's an interesting dichotomy between the term user, right? Between Web 2, Web 2.5, and Web 3. Where in Web 2, a user is like you or me, and like you know who they are, or you have an IDFA or some identifier. In Web 3, though, it's like this pseudonymous wallet that people might have multiple of them and don't want their identity revealed. And it's almost like this like crazy, ironically, privacy-conscious world that everything's recorded on blockchain. So it's like super private yet super public. Uh, how do you mesh the two? And how do you think about letting users know that they're being targeted for certain, maybe it's NFTs or airdrops or on-chain actions, when one of the ethos of Web3 is, I don't want that. I, I want to avoid people knowing who I am, yet everything is public, right? It's, it's almost this mental model that needs to shift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be a massive collision between like the privacy world, which is now fairly well regulated via GDPR and CCPA. I mean, both legally and there's ethically, there's norms around it. And this Web3 world that, as you said, is on the one hand kind of privacy obsessed, on the other hand, everything's public in, in ways that like would never exist in like a regular credit card payment system, right? Like Visa doesn't post your transactions, but Bitcoin does, right? It's a little, it's a little weird, right? So yeah, I think you're gonna have to rethink a lot of things. I mean, I, th I think you, you touched on two things. One, identity is a little fractured in the Web3 world, right? Like you have lots of wallets and there isn't a unitary vision of you as a user in the way that there would be in the Facebook user ID. Of course, Web2 shares some of those problems as well. You have more than one device, you erase your cookies. Like it's not an unknown problem. I think the bigger problem is what you're saying, which is like, what is the user expectation of privacy? Privacy is a big topic. I think a lot of the active, there's like a whole privacy industrial complex of people who, <laughs> who either legislate about privacy or talk about it or comment on it or whatever. And I think the views of those people are often very different than the users themselves, right? 
I think your average user thinks of privacy as a commodity that they trade for other things, right? They trade privacy for a sense of community, right? Because they expose their lives on social media or they trade their live, you know, the privacy for convenience, right? You save your payment credentials on Amazon because you don't want to like enter your fucking credit card all the time. It also means Amazon knows everything you buy, right? And so, you know, as Web3 scales to like more normie users, I think it's going to become a little bit less privacy obsessed. And the reality is like your average normally web three user when when it, when and if they materialize is not going to have 50 wallets and a hot and cold storage and a ledger and all that shit. He's going to have one hot, you know one wallet that they just promiscuously log into fucking everything with. There's like 600 NFTs in there that he, half of them he doesn't know where the fuck they came from. He's got like 50 shit coins, 10 whatever. Yeah, it's going to be this total mess. It's going to be like the cookies on your browser. If you look at the cookies in your browser, there's hundreds of them in there, right? It's going to be the exact same thing for wallets when when Web3 goes goes mainstream. Which of course, again, it's not diminishing the need for privacy, but as you said, I think it's funny if you actually Google like GDPR and Web3 and crypto, you get like one or two hits. <laughs> there's like one coin desk piece that's mostly explaining what GDPR is. And then a sales pitch for some random crypto company you've never heard of that claims they've solved the problem with like zero knowledge proofs. It's like, dude, like I just, I pay money to watch the interaction of like crypto bro with like EU regulator and hit, you know, and crypto bro trying to explain that like ZK snarks are going to solve all this. <laughs> like, I'm like, <laughs> I really don't think it's going to go down like crypto bro. <laughs> um, but um, so anyhow, sorry, not to, not to be too snarky about ZK Snarks, but um, yeah, I, mean, I think I think there's a big conversation to be had there. But you know, it'll get worked out. Like I, I don't think this is an unsolvable problem. I mean, you know, people say as like, well, the, the blockchain is immutable and not erasable. It's like it's not quite true, right? All data isn't on chain. You can have private chains. I mean, there's solutions here. So I I think we'll get to a solution, but it's it's not going to be the way. It's not going to be like little web browser pop ups like in GDPR. <laughs> Clearly, it's going to have to work some other way. But yeah, privacy is a problem. And I, you know, it's kind of weird that the ecosystem hasn't thought about it because the way it works in Web2 now, right? If you're a practitioner in some, some place that GDPR touches ads, attribution, whatever, like the, you know, it used to be that when I was at Facebook, it used to be like the final legal sign off you got at the end, like before shipping, you'd show up to your privacy council meeting and give them the, the, the download. And they're like, oh my God, when are you going to ship this next week? Oh my God. And they'd run around like little bees and try to get it all papered over before you shipped. That was like 10 years ago. Now, total, like a brand, for example, you know, still a startup, but above board and you know very compliant like day one you're talking to the legal counsel to make sure that you're not architecting something that you're gonna have to re-architect later because privacy won't allow it right so it's it's like a day one conversation these days and it somehow it doesn't seem to be yet a day one conversation on the web3 side but you know i'm sure the the ecosystem will mature and it, it particularly if like old web2 boomers like me get into it then it'll, it'll definitely mature <laughs> now i'm talking my own book here but yeah well well speaking of that we're, 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 we're near time here. Um, this has been an awesome overview for, for interested uh, listeners who might be engineers or prospective uh, collaborators in some capacity. Um, and so maybe let's close by you just giving a preview of how you're thinking about uh, entering the space yourself. Well, well, I think there's two approaches to the problem, right? So there's, so there's already a pain point, right? If you talk to these companies and you're just like, have you calculated your customer acquisition costs? They're like, uh, what? Uh, I mean, they may not even know what it is, or some actually do know, because a lot of them do come from Web2 Gaming. And they're like, uh, not really, really well. Maybe you can solve that problem for us, right? So you can actually start solving some of the immediate pain points. I think the, the fuller vision, which is I was sort of hinting at, which is imagine you have a token and a protocol that effectively tracks downstream events of interest to app developers, right? And allows you to write smart contracts that actually incentivize that behavior to other people, ad networks, affiliates, whoever, right? Influencers, whatever the case might be. And so the bigger vision of this the dream vision is something like ENS or Uniswap, right? It's, it's, a, it's a token and a protocol out in the world that fulfills a very basic core function of the Web3 world that needs to exist. And that is balanced and engineered in such a way that everyone who should get paid does get paid. And it enables all sorts of new and interesting use cases that wouldn't exist before. And so, you know, the correct way to do that would be to, you know, get it funded, love to talk to technical people to actually have a whiteboard jam session to actually architect this thing and then go into a cave and you know three to four months later actually start shipping the initial version of it integrate with a gaming partner or whoever and actually you know release this thing to the wild and watch it work i think we take a lot of fine tuning i think there's i think people out there might say oh but what about fraud yeah i think fraud's gonna be a real issue um you know it's not necessarily a bad sign by the way like if you if you ship something and it's not exploited by criminals is it really useful right <laughs> like like if it, if like the first use case is actually criminals it's not necessarily such a bad thing although of course you don't want actually fraud in the space in general so yeah no i'm excited again i you know if there was some way for me to just go long the the notion of attribution in web3 without my having to do anything other than just like write a check i would just do that because i'm completely convinced that in the next five years this one assuming web3 takes off this will have to exist right yeah. um the, the question is the details and all there's a lot of detail maybe we're too early but um yeah i'm pretty confident that this this will exist 
Well, it's, it's great to have you back as a, as a builder. You know, I, I, I think you, you could be definitely a pioneer in the space. At the very least, worst case, we'll get a Michael Lewis memoir of the crypto of Web3 in a decade. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm just using, uh, no, no, I'm really excited for what you're doing. Uh, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast, Antonio. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And for people who want to follow more, definitely check out the poll request, uh, follow Antonio Garcia Martinez on Twitter. If you're a builder, feel free to, to DM him or, or, or get in touch with him. Antonio, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks. See you, Eric. See you. In. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, We'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.